Well, for six weeks back in part of April and most of May, I participated in a Rotary International Group Study Exchange to Queensland, Australia, where I stayed with over 17 different host families to learn more about their culture and their state's culture. And one thing that I noticed was that a lot of people wear shorts most of the time, either for leisure, but also for work, especially if it entails work outside, because obviously it's very hot for the majority of the year. And if you compare it, it's somewhat similar to South Florida as far as a climate and environment. But the thing that I found very interesting was the fact that a lot of the men who wore shorts, they also wear boots, obviously for safety protection, and it's type of rope or boot that has elastic on each side, but what they also wear are these boot covers, and it's just a little bit of material that has elastic at the top, and they slide it over their shoes to keep dust out of it, grass clippings, any kind of trash or debris from getting inside the shoe. Now obviously they don't make a very good fashion statement, especially for Americans as far as something we're used to, but if you think about the practicality of them, you can't really beat them. And I thought it might be something you might enjoy seeing as gardeners, something you might want to even try if you like to wear shorts and you get a lot of grass in your shoes. Now most of them refer to them as boot covers. Some people I did hear call them bow yangs. But actually, as I studied a little bit more, bow yang was a string that they would tie on their pants to kind of keep the cuffs from dragging on the ground. So whether you call them boot covers or bow yangs, again, it may some, be something that you want to try just while you're working in your landscape. Well, now the trip also offered many great opportunities for me to tour and see as much horticulture as I possibly could. And of course, I took along my camcorder where I shot some video that I'd like to share with you today about some plants that we grow as annuals here in Oklahoma. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the copper leaf plant. That's a common name. And I've got one in a container here. It has really brilliant colored foliage on it. We've used it probably for three, four, even five years here at our studio gardens. It's grown more for its foliage. You've seen us use it around our compost pile because even in one growing season, we can get it to grow probably three feet tall. And then of course the winter comes and kills it. But on the footage or video that I want to share with you, you'll see, it's not very clear, but you'll see some variegated green and some of the red variegation. But they will actually grow anywhere from six to 10 feet high there in Australia. And it grows pretty much as a perennial. So they'll do a little bit of shearing or hedging depending on how they want to grow it. But I couldn't believe the height of some of it that I had seen there in Queensland. Now also, you've seen us introduce last year Scavola, and Scavola is a native of Australia. We've grown it on the studio grounds as an annual flower again around our barn. You've seen it as a ground cover. It has the fan-shaped flowers with purple and yellow in them, and the hotter and drier it gets, the better. And that's pretty obvious when, again, you think of the climate in Australia. Again, that's Scavola, and they have about three native species and I've even seen it when I was over there with the white flower, so hopefully that will be coming later on in the United States as well. I also saw a lot of penta or star flower growing over there. Of course, we have it this year in our hummingbird garden. It's also around our raised, some of our raised beds and our ground beds as well as around the barn. It's also called penta or star flower. Again, it comes in pinks and purples, but that one was used quite often, again, as an annual. And remember here, the hummingbirds love it. The one that really caught my attention, though, I think, was poinsettia. Now, again, in this footage that I'm showing you, it's of a landscape bed in a, the Brisbane Botanical Garden. And if you'll look, the poinsettia is actually growing there. Now, you don't see it blooming yet, but you'll, if you look and think of the foliage, what it's shaped like, you'll be able to pick that plant out. But poinsettia, again, is grown as a perennial there. And I saw some, again, as tall as probably 6, 8, 10, even 12 feet tall. The really unique part is that the time that they bloom there really isn't associated with Christmas. Remember, their seasons are opposite. So while we were there, we were just going into the winter time. The shorter days and the cooler temperatures, the poinsettia was just starting to bloom. And so again, that would be our summer, June, July, which Christmas there is their hottest time of year. Now, a cousin to the poinsettia that I did get some slide photos of is called Bangkok Rose or Christmas Rose. This one was quite spectacular. Again, it's grown as a shrub. It comes in either pinkish color uh, blooms or white, 
But it, again, it's like the poinsettia. What you're seeing are the leaves or the bracts that are turning color. The flower is actually very inconspic inconspicuous, and I've got a photo, a close-up of one. It's yellow, but it's very small. So the brilliant color is really what you're seeing the, of the foliage. So again, that's very similar to the poinsettia here in the States. Now also at our studio gardens, you've seen us grow blue days or evolvulus quite often. We normally grow it in partial shade. We've had it around our aristocrat pear. One year around the water garden, it has a little bluish color flower that blooms early in the morning or on cloudy days when it gets real sunny, sometimes they close up. Well, it's actually native again to Australia and there's several different species of it. And I did see one on an island that was low growing with the same small delicate flower but very obvious again. The other thing is of some slides I have of blue days growing in full sun, which I guess we'll have to try now that I've seen it done in Australia. Of course, it would require more water, but it's one I think that we'll try probably in the next uh, season. Now, it was also interesting to note that many of the plants that we grow again as house plants and some of our favorite annuals are on a list referred to as a noxious weed list. And if you look on this sheet I have here, this is Shire, which is the same as our county. They've put out a list of what not to plant. And again, it says that they're very invasive plants. And you can tell that I've highlighted some here with the yellow highlight that I want to talk to you about. And one of them is a house plant that we call snake plant or mother-in-law tongue, Sansevieria. And if you've ever grown it in a container as a house plant, you know that it spreads through underground rhizomes. And you can imagine if the winter would never kill that back, it could take over. So it's very aggressive. And I have a slide of one where they've contained it under a tree, kind of as a bedding plant ground cover. Also in front of me is Shephalera. There, Shephalera grows into a tree. It's called umbrella tree. It even blooms with brilliant red flowers. It gets quite huge, but the root system is very aggressive. So again, it's one that they really discourage people from growing. Now, as far as annual flowers, this is one we brought to you last year called, uh, and remember initially we thought it was Indian runner, but it's really Wadilia is the proper name. This one does great again for Oklahoma's hot summers. We're growing it this year in one of our raised beds in the formal garden as a ground cover. It's starting to grow right out of the bed. So again, you can imagine in Australia what it would do. It's definitely on the noxious weed list. They refer to it as mile a minute because they say this plant can grow mile a minute and takes over. But really the common name over there is Singapore daisy. So again, it does great for us, but it's very invasive over there. Next to it is probably another one that really tolerates our hot, dry summers, and that's Lantana. Now, sometimes people will tell me in Oklahoma they can get them to overwinter. We've never been successful at that, really, here at the Studio Gardens. But it's not a native to Australia. It was introduced many years ago, and now it's become naturalized. And so they have the shrubby type that will grow sometimes 10, 12 feet tall and about that same width. They also have one down here that they call the ground cover lantana, which is the purple one, and it only stays, say, six, eight, 10 inches, but it is literally taking over the country because it loves the hot, dry conditions. This one is becoming so much of a weed that they have introduced what is called a lantana beetle, although I never did see one. I did take a slide of some of the damage on the lantana leaves. And to me, it almost looks like a leaf miner damage. So I'm not really sure what type of insect it is, but basically it feeds on the leaves and it's eventually killing out the lantana. So they're trying to get it under control. Now, you know, one of our themes this year is American Indian gardens. Well, Australia also has a strong native culture of aboriginals that were also very dependent on using plants. Well, we actually toured an Aboriginal center called Dreamtime where we learned about some of these plants' uses. Let's listen to some of the examples. Okay, but not only that, it's a medicine plant. What they do if they had to cut any part of their body, they get the leaves, fold the leaves out of that, or chew them up and then put it into the cut, and it would stop the bleeding, and also start healing the cut up. 
Now there are other similarities between Australian and Oklahoma gardeners. One of those being, of course, that they're both very friendly. They love to share ideas and the fruits of their labor. And they also love water gardening. I also took some video of one in particular at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Garth Peterson in Maryborough, Queensland. This garden is literally in their front yard where the waterfall trickles down a slope to their front door and then empties into a pond with fish and of course plenty of water garden plants. And believe it or not, I also got to tour a spectacular garden railroad in the city of Harvey Bay. The display garden is actually part of Malcolm and Karen Kilpatrick's M&K Model Railways business. It's a wonderful garden railway that has several different sections to it. Everything from an area where a building is on fire, complete with firefighters and equipment, to a gondola that simulates transportation of people up and down the side of a mountain. Now as far as plant material goes in the Garden Railroad, it contained primarily conifers and a colorful mix of Mexican heather. As far as home vegetable gardens go though, only a small percentage of my host families even had one. One that did catch my attention though was at the home of Neville and Cheryl O'Sullivan in Merib. Somewhat typical to small gardens in Oklahoma with tomatoes, peppers, and lettuce. But the biggest difference, I think, though, was that Cheryl actually started the entire garden by direct seeding instead of transplants. Now, one thing that may not be obvious by this video, again, that I shot, is that to keep a garden and landscape looking this good, it requires lots of irrigation, especially since some parts of Queensland had not had measurable rainfall in three to five years. Well, you may be asking, what about commercial horticulture in Queensland? Well, there's plenty of it. Especially, it's uh, very big in the citrus growing area where the trees are nicely grown in rows and of course with trickle irrigation again. The mandarin oranges were just starting to ripen while we were there, but the others citrus was not far behind such as lemons and other types of oranges. You'll also find commercial fields of fresh tomatoes, which they call tomatoes again grown similar to those in South Florida and to ours here at our studio garden, all being staked and trellised. The tomatoes are then picked by hand and loaded into a large tub of water that is hauled to the packing shed. The tomatoes are then carried by water to avoid bruising through the cleaning process and on to a grating and assortment area by a conveyor belt and then packed for both import and export. Now gardening and the outdoors would not be complete without wildlife and boy did we see lots of it, especially native birds that many Americans keep in cages as pets. One of the most colorful and noisy was the lorikeet that my first host family, Fred and Judy Bowyer of Gladstone, fed by placing honey on bread on feeding trays. Well, and like many of our organizations here in the United States, it's easy to find a lot of educational materials to support what your gardening interest might be in Australia. For example, I have what is called a Forest Service tree note on catering for wildlife, and it's actually put out by the DPI of Queensland, which stands for the Department of Primary Industries, and that's similar to our Department of Agriculture. The only difference is the DPI is also the organization that really caters and manages the extension service where here it's Oklahoma State University. There's also another information sheet called Planting for Wildlife and this one is put out by the Queensland National Parks and Wildlife Service again very similar to some of our organizations and you can tell that planting for wildlife and gardening for wildlife is very popular there just like it is here in Oklahoma. Well I hope you're enjoying this brief touch of gardening from down under and I want to encourage you to be sure and stick around because next week we're going to explore some of the gardening television programs in Australia. So be sure and join us again next week.